For Thursday, September 17th, we'll take a look at Sally making its exodus across the southeast and a very rare tropical cyclone making its way eastward through the Mediterranean between Italy and Greece. And there we see a graphic of the storm. This is from a website called wxcharts.com. Here we have Italy. There's Sicily. Here we have the Balkans. Greece is down here. Turkey is over here. And the rest of this is the Mediterranean. So what we're seeing over the next 24 hours is the system drifting towards the Greek coast. As it approaches, we got a central pressure of about 989, which is a little bit higher than what we had with Sally. And you can see a well-defined eye wall there. The system arrives on the coast about 9Z, which is early tomorrow morning, European time. Then it appears there's some terrain interactions, and then the system kind of drifts south. Now this site does offer peak wind gusts through the entire cycle, and you can see an accumulated plot here. It's interesting that we don't get these in the U.S., so we may have to start using this site a little bit more to look at North American hurricanes. But you can see the track there of the max winds, and these correspond to about 110 to 120 kilometers an hour, which is about 70 to 80 miles an hour. There's a plot here of 130 kilometers an hour that appears to correspond to that right there. You can see that on the legend and in the wind plot. So it appears there's probably a little bit of weakening as it approaches the Greek coast. Now the closest thing we have to anything resembling NHC or SPC is Estofax. And there's a quick look at the mesoscale discussion that they have showing the track and expected rainfall totals. And what you're seeing here is sustained winds in meters per second. So you can roughly double that to get miles per hour. And Greece does have the warnings in effect. If we run the translation, there you go. There it is on the right. You can freeze frame that and read it at your convenience. I did try to bring that into Mechitis with the BD curve. Unfortunately, that's about as good as it gets. Europe is not very generous with their satellite data, so we don't have a lot of real-time products and we have to settle for this 24 kilometer resolution imagery. So that doesn't really correspond to much of anything as far as the Dvorak intensity curve. That's probably near T1 or T2. Yeah, it looks like maybe T2 there. So that's up in the tropical storm range, but I'm not too sure how much of that applies to the Mediterranean. The Greek radar network showing the outer spiral bands, the main part of the storm way out here, out of range. But here we have a wind product from the Greek Meteorological Agency. And this shows the winds in knots as the system approaches the coast. And as for conventional satellite data, I don't know if we're going to be able to get the same quality that we're used to here in the U.S. So that's going to be the infrared loop. And that's the visible imagery. It's nighttime there right now. Yeah, I don't know what to do about the imagery. This is highly reprocessed. Yeah, this reminds me of trying to get satellite imagery 25 years ago. I don't know, every site I'm pulling up is the same low-resolution stuff. If you all know of any good high-resolution large image sites, let me know. I would be curious to find out. Anyway, this is how it looks on Pivotal Weather. So the track is going to come in through this part of Greece right here. The eye wall will initially impact this area here and then just kind of move inland. And as I mentioned, that looks to be maybe 60 to 70, maybe 80 miles an hour on impact, and then rapidly diminishing. 
There is no coverage of that area on any of the tropical forecasting sites. You can see that area is not in any international forecasting plan. I don't know of anybody that's handling that except at the country level. It seems like they need to do something about that if these are going to become more and more common. All right, bringing things back to the U.S. Sally is on its way out. Looks like the remnants are still over Georgia. We are looking at this storm here southeast of Brownsville. Expected to form, and we went over that yesterday with the European and GFS. Teddy is going to be moving northwest, still on track to hit the area around Bermuda Monday. So it looks like this is more in line with the European model. Still not too sure about this invest west of the African coast. That track also follows the European solution and only a 50% chance of formation. Yesterday we were looking at development on that being kind of weak and eventually diminishing to an easterly wave. So our main storm of interest will be Teddy as it approaches Bermuda early next week and then this will likely start developing. So let's switch over to the models and see what's in store for the Gulf. All right, let's take a look at WXCharts.com for our GFS forecast. This is a great overview of the Atlantic, Gulf of Mexico, and Caribbean. So we're looking at wind gusts here. We're starting out near the model run today and running that forward. You can see Teddy moving up towards Bermuda, located right here. This is on Friday, and as we go forward towards Saturday and Sunday, that storm grazes them once again. The GFS brings that just to the east of there right around Monday. So it looks like the GFS has accelerated a little bit and come in line with the European model. And then after Monday, it's out of the picture. The other story is the Gulf of Mexico. Let's go back to the beginning and kind of watch this general area here. The GFS develops a tropical depression off the coast of Louisiana. You can see that coming together there on Saturday. Wind gusts are about 60 to 70 kilometers an hour, which is about 40 miles an hour. So this is in the low end of the tropical cyclone spectrum, or tropical storm spectrum. And then we see that moving westward towards the Texas coast during the day on Sunday, and then the circulation pretty much dissipates. Now there's this new storm down here in the Bay of Campeche on Tuesday. Let's see what the GFS does with that. A little bit of strengthening and then it brings that into the northwest part of Mexico around Friday. And then things are quiet after that. European model has a different solution and of course the European model skill has been pretty good. So let's check that out. First, we'll look at Teddy. There it is, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and there's Bermuda coming into range. Teddy passes, looks like just east of Bermuda on Monday. So that's coming into agreement with the GFS. And then it's out of the picture. That may be having some impacts in the Maritimes maybe Maine. So we'll have to see what happens next week. Now the other story is out in the Gulf. Let's watch that same area out here. Again, remember we're looking at the European model, very high skill dynamical model. And we see a system coming together here, not so much developing up there near Louisiana like the GFS had. So this is Friday evening. When that forward, we see more development. This comes together just east of Brownsville, maybe 150 miles offshore, develops into the 50, 60 mile an hour range. So this is the high end tropical storm range. And continued development between Brownsville and Corpus Christi going into Monday. And the storm seems to back off and move up the coast as a high end tropical storm. Not sure it's into the hurricane range just yet, but that's heading up towards Louisiana Tuesday and Wednesday, and then it makes landfall 
around the central coast of Louisiana around Thursday. So that's the solution for the European model. Either way, it looks like things are going to be active in this area over the next five days. So we finally break away from the tropics and look at the weather in the southwestern U.S. Heat low in the southwestern U.S. with temperatures 106 there at Phoenix and 106 at Lake Havasu City, El Centro 107. Got a very weak heat trough in the California Valleys and warm conditions out in the Great Basin area with lots of mid-80s and gusty winds. There's a satellite there. Looks like a little bit of jet energy running across the San Joaquin Valley. Looks like the area is dominated by a large ridge. If we went to the upper level charts, we would probably see that in place. And looks like the cumulus field in the higher elevations is a little bit suppressed this afternoon. In the northwestern U.S., clear skies in a lot of places, but a very pervasive smoke layer. You can see it's really thick there around uh, just west of Boise. I guess that's around Caldwell, Idaho, up towards the Pendleton area, up to Spokane. And some of that smoke even making its way into the central U.S. If you've stepped outside around sunset, you've probably noticed kind of a yellowish, pale color to the setting sun. Not so much the blue and salmon colors. That's the smoke from the wildfires. In the northern plains, we've got northerly flow there with cold advection cumulus across the Dakotas, and we can check that out on the surface map. Canadian high is up there near Winnipeg, and we've got northerly flow through that region. Cool day with upper 50s and lower 60s in much of that region. New outbreak of cold air coming south. This is kind of a weak Alberta clipper that's probably moving southeast and kind of a weak front banked up against the Rockies. The northwestern U.S., Seattle, Oregon, looks like they're under a warm air mass. Kind of a nice day except for that smoke there. Temperatures in the 70s and even in Seattle, 71 degrees. Unseasonably cool in the northeastern U.S. That seems like a story we've heard all year. Temperatures in the 50s and 60s and even some 40s up there in northern Ontario. There comes that uh, little Alberta Clipper thing probably heading for Missouri or Iowa. And down to the south we can see the approach of Sally. And yeah, I should probably add a little continental polar air mass marking. There we go. The cirrus outflow from Sally making it all the way into New York and New Hampshire at this hour and the, the thicker convective bands moving up into Virginia and Maryland. And let's shift down south and get a closer look at that. There we go, some well-defined convection from Charleston, South Carolina, all the way up towards the Roanoke area, kind of extending down and say, this kind of looks like a front to me. The cloud field does look different. Uh, maybe, maybe across the boundary it looks different, then you get back in here and we get into a different air mass. Let me try drawing that one more time. This kind of looks like the same thing to me with a MCS right through the middle of it. And then we got this other stuff out here. This looks more stratified. And this could be more cool air just kind of wrapping around the backside. So I might be looking for a front in this area right there. And there's likely, you know, due to the extent of this cloud mass here, I think there could be kind of a warm front maybe somewhere along the Carolina coast. So let's put it together. There we go. That's what I'm seeing for frontal positions there. You can see that difference up there in Ohio, mid-60s, contrasting with the low 80s around the Louisville and Cincinnati area. And that kind of carries down southwest all the way to Dallas as a cold front where we have thunderstorms going on right now. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear the rain out there, but it is coming down. And there's Sally 
Looks like that's evolved into an extra tropical low. Cold front extending down into the Apalachicola area and warm front. Looks like that goes all the way to just north of Myrtle Beach. And certainly the air mass behind it a little bit more stable. Maybe not so much out here, but it does look like an air mass contrast with this stuff down to the south. Much more humid down in that region. Dew points in the mid to upper 70s. And that's all I got for this edition of Forecast Lab. Thank you for joining us, and we will see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.